part seven. Since Hiller took his time to recap my videos, I've decided to provide a little more substance to some of the things discussed previously, answer a few questions, and give an update on a few developments. Early on, Andrew um, thinks that the word safe was a weird, or not a weird, a um, choice of word, an interesting choice of word. Uh, if you've ever been in a dangerously uncomfortable situation, that's what it felt like when people surrounded Dave in a, just a circle around him almost where he, there was no way out, it felt like. It didn't, I didn't feel safe for him. It was, uh, it was weird to see, and the reason it was happening is just because he wasn't speaking into the mic at that point, which we're going to talk about. Um, but coming from a guy that doesn't like his back to the door in certain public places and not to be able to see people, I could imagine and would love to know and ask him a personal question about how he felt during that moment. Um, but why he wasn't speaking into the mic, uh, he lowered the mic after telling us a lot of things about the competition trying to continue, and then some people asked him questions. Things got a little bit kind of personal, and it seemed like it was just more one person's opinion on the question, so he was kind of trying to answer that person, um, and I think that's why he lowered the mic. Um, it was only after him answering the question and people started to group around that they really wanted to hear and people actually started sh shouting out, um, speak into the mic, um, aggressively to say the least. Um, not everyone could hear his responses so you can understand why people came in so close. Um, so it wasn't, I don't think it was on purpose, um, I think it was just a way to address somebody kind of more on a personal level, but everybody was already so intimate in that setting and wanted to know everything. So I, I think that in hindsight, he probably just would have spoken to the mic the whole time. The, uh, the whole reason we split up a little bit of controversy, I guess some people were wondering why we split into groups. Uh, we split into groups of one group for the teams, one group for the males, individuals, the female individuals and the coaches, all in the separate parts of the floor. Um, I think that was actually a good decision at the time just to give everybody an opportunity to speak up rather than a massive herd of 200 people trying to get one person to speak at a time and it was going to be easier if we divided up a little bit and maybe some like-minded results would come from that. I actually didn't mind the decision. Um, I could have been wrong about that um, in hindsight, um, but I really don't know. I agreed with it, what was the decision then. Um, I don't know if it helped or hurt because that was when I talked about as soon as we split up, it got even worse, at least with the team's division. I would like to know if it got worse with the individuals, um, but I, I don't have insight of that. Um, Andrew also talked about decisions we make and how he talks um, um, to his girlfriend about um, what will matter in five years. This is true. I mean, it, it's a... And what CrossFit did that weekend, what they do now in the sense also, um, will really affect everything and we'll see what that's like five years down the road. Um, look how long it's taken for CrossFit to recover from the decisions that Glassman made in terms of the CrossFit games and open participation and the trickle down effect that had and the affiliates and then the, the statement and his, re his removal or, or himself removal and selling uh, CrossFit. Every decision matters. They really need, and CrossFit is they, they, CrossFit really needs to get this decision right. Whatever that means, we will see. But this decision feels like everything's on the line a little bit. The legitimacy of the comp was a debate, a little bit of a discussion. Um, seemed there was a, a larger amount of the European individuals and, and teams that wanted the competition to be changed into an exhibition. That's just my opinion from what we saw in terms of people speaking out. It wasn't everybody, it wasn't unanimous from the um, European group. But um, it, I think this is just a, a cultural divide, a, a difference in opinion and understanding. Um, probably very different and hard for us to understand how people in the United States operate and some other countries versus how some people operate overseas. I think this was just, like I said, a cultural thing, a little bit of a divide and a sensitive topic, I think. 
at some point, um, the representatives were arguing, and this was the representatives from the five individuals, males, females, and teams, and coaches, we're kind of discussing and it got into an argument over the title of the fittest on earth and champions being crowned and points being awarded. Um, I kind of I pointed out that I thought it was a little bit ridiculous to not have those things. Um, I think that would affect the legitimacy of the, of the comp even more. Uh, I thought and I said this at the time that that was like saying that because Tia had had a baby the year before and Roman broke his ankle that Laura's championship and Jeff Adler's championships don't matter then if we're gonna compare um, you know the situations and and the the outcomes if those things were different then we have different outcomes possibly just like this year just because something tragic happens no matter how tragic or how big or how small it's going to affect the outcome this did upset some people um, responding saying that's just not the same thing and, and while I agree it's not the same but it's similar in ways and, and similarities is one of the things that we can draw evidence from real evidence and, and make valid points and arguments and discussions rather than just using your feelings and making an opinion based off of those if the competition goes on and, and a, a winner is crowned at the end that's 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 what it is that's all that matters the, the circumstances are the circumstances everybody has to deal with them and whatever's given so the whole like kind of put an asterisk next to it conversation or should it not count or um, you know the legitimacy of it it is what it is and everybody that chose to continue on continued on and they went against each other and all somewhat compromised states of mind and at the end of it, I think that um, those people, um, while they may feel not as whole as they normally would have um, with what transpired, um, they're still rightful heirs and of their, their crowns and championships. They're the, they're the rightful owners of those titles. So I, I don't really think there's much of an argument for that in terms of right or wrong and who deserves these titles. This is the what it is for the year. Uh, the changes in the competition, I, I can't tell you how many times I heard people say that's CrossFit's problem. And I mean that in addressing certain demands that individuals or teams or coaches had. This was, I really didn't like that response because CrossFit's problem was our problem now. And we were all going to need to deal with it. Uh, I kept hearing it over and over again. And a lot of times it would come after some kind of claim or something somebody wanted and it was very upset or emotional. Um, everything that we did or they had to do was going to have a trickle down effect. Cuts, workouts, timelines, they were all connected. People would say, I don't want any cuts. And then I would try to explain to some of them that that's going to be difficult. Um, that changes all their plans, workout time frames, equipment, judging, the um, TV scheduling. You know, when you have more athletes participating individually and um, on teams, that changes everything. It literally snowballs, just creating more problems. And I don't think people were looking past just what they wanted to what they were going to, what CrossFit was going to deal with now. Um, and I think this definitely affected the programming for the last workout on the team side. We had like a, I think it was like 15 or 18 minute time cap for a workout that took between like six to seven minutes for a lot of people. It was the one with the snail down, deadlifts, back, and then the snail back, that was it. Um, the time cap was long and from what I heard in discussions, um, and our coach talked to somebody that straight up told him this workout was supposed to look a lot different. And did that workout look different because they were doing two heats of 10 teams instead of one like they expected to on the final day? There was a lot to, to unfold and everything that we did was gonna affect that and everything that they did was gonna affect that. And I just didn't like this, everybody saying it's CrossFit's problem because it was our problem too. Um, this was the first time or first moment where I really recognized some people were fighting for something like no cuts because they had a personal agenda. And I mean by that is that 
they were worried about the cuts previous to the competition starting and that this was a chance for them to at least hang around for the whole weekend. Uh, I didn't like that. I didn't like it. I could hear it in their voices and it was, it was tough to hear and understand. I, I understood that everybody wanted a legitimate comp and programming to the point of which before cuts happened. Uh, and I think they did that for the most part. Um, but the programming was going to get compromised. And it was going to compromise everything else. And that was going to pro uh, compromise the legitimacy of the comp even more if we just kept everybody in all weekend and did five-minute workouts instead of any 20-minute workouts. Um, and I think that's kind of what happened in the final workout for the teams. Uh, one of the things I did not mention previously, uh, but I feel is important, um, some people have started talking about it now, was that Roman spoke up. Um, to the whole group. He spoke twice, once in the first meeting and then again in the final meeting. Um, this was, this was um, pretty powerful, pretty awesome in my opinion, just because you gotta remember he's still learning English and his ability to hear it, not only and speak it, um, is probably pretty difficult in a big group setting. And um, he was pretty patient. I'll, I'll paraphrase here, but his message pretty much was that uh, we shouldn't be the ones making these decisions and that CrossFit should decide what they need to decide about the competition. And then we should just as individuals decide if we want to participate. Um, he said more, um, but that was kind of his point. Um, and then he said it again, like I, I said, he just spoke up twice in separate meetings. Um, he was very patient. He waited a long time to speak. I think it was kind of out of hearing enough and then wanting to move on. Um, part of me when I heard this was like, yeah, what he said, like, can we all go home now? Um, because he had said it the second time and, uh, and we were all kind of ready to move on at that point to getting things started and just trusting CrossFit a little bit. Um, we didn't exactly get that personally. We actually got stuck, my team, in traffic for two hours leaving the competition. Uh, I got stuck on the expressway, headed north to our house. Um, there was a police chase that um, got stopped on the bridge in an overpass and they shut down all the roads and we literally did not move for over two hours. So we didn't even get home until 10.30 that night. Um, so it made an already long, tragic, hard, stressful day even seem longer. Um, I was happy to go to bed that night and try to just get back together and, and do something the next day. Um, it was definitely tough. The, uh, the next thing that Hiller pointed out was that uh, nobody's really responded on the internet that much to what I've been saying or at least disputing it. And I think that's because everything I've spoken from so far is, is accurate from my vantage point through the lens that I saw it and the competition. Uh, I haven't said anything con really controversial yet. Um, I've and I've been saving any speculation I have for future topics and private conversations until I really have um, what I want to say together. Um, but one of the things that you know, I did call out a few people, not by necessarily by name. And Noah did reach out and responded, and, and uh, we discussed things privately. And I'll go into some of that at the end of this segment. Um, but not specifics of any sort. Uh, one of the things on that topic was that we talked about like asking for the earthworm previously when I was discussing the name of safety. Well, <laughs> the earthworm may have been granted, but when they announced the snail for our final event, a lot of people had never used it. It had been at the games a long, I think in 2016, I think it was the last time. Um, I, I, I could be mistaken, the individuals used it, maybe it was some other, maybe there's been other comps, rogue stuff, but um, it, I don't think anybody on the teams really had touched it much. Um, but as soon as they announced that piece of equipment, um, before athletes could take any questions were taken by any of the athletes, um, they quickly said that the snail would not be touched previous to being on the floor by anybody and Boz just walked away. Um, so I could tell right then and there, he's, when the way he said it, he wasn't going to budge on this one. And uh, I think that was related for sure to what had been previously asked. Uh, the idea that Hiller brought up of, of Dave being helped out by a team and not replacing him, I think it's a good idea. It's something that um, 
it could be made up from co coaches and maybe former competitors, direct relationship and pulse to like the current climate and variables that go with competing. This is part of a segment that I'm going to go into that will have some speculation, so that's why I've been saving it for uh, another video. My conversation that took place, and, and I'm going to close with this, that um, with Noah, Noah reached out a few days ago and we connected for a discussion just to hear each other out and clear up any frustrations on, um, on my part or his part. Um, just so people understand, I met Noah like, like 10 years ago. Well, we were both doing um, grid, we were on teams. Um, he was just bursting onto the scene with CrossFit. I certainly knew who he was and his potential. Uh, me, I, on the other hand, let's just say wasn't uh, as well known. But I was respected and I was good at my job and what I did. Uh, we never talked that much, but in passing, you know, we're always real respectful of each other. Saw him um, training on the side also, and I, I was sometimes doing extra stuff to um, work on all the things that we work on outside of the team competition that we were doing. In, in our recent conversation, nothing we discussed directly is changing how I felt about the situation then, or what I stated previously, and, or stand by. But the one thing I want people to know is that at the end of the day, Noah is still a person, and while being a captain of a team for a long, so long time myself, and I can relate to some of the challenges that go with the responsibility. He, he was certainly having to manage not only himself, but his teammates also. I get that, I've been there. While I may not agree with some of their decisions, and I would like to think that I would have certainly handled things differently in the same situation, which I have discussed in, in other videos previously, the truth is we really don't know how we would react to a situation until we're in the exact same situation. So it's, it's hard to save some of that judgment. This conversation we had and we were discussing, it really reminded me of a time where I told my oldest daughter, who was about five at the time, um, that she did something bad. I realized my poor choice of words in the moment, but didn't think it was gonna be a big deal. I was hoping that she probably didn't even hear me. Um, but a few days later, she did something else. And uh, as kids do, she knew she was gonna be in trouble for it. I don't even remember what it was. But before I could say anything to her, she said, I'm a bad daughter and my heart sank like it hit me like a cement truck even just talking about it, it's not fun uh, I quickly grabbed her got down on a knee on her level looked her in the eyes and told her she isn't a bad daughter and that she's a great daughter I explained to her that sometimes we make mistakes or do bad things but that doesn't make us a bad person. It matters what we learn from our mistakes and what we do moving forward, that we will have an opportunity to make things right. Telling this to a five-year-old while being overwhelmed with self-judgment, even still now, and emotion wasn't easy. I'm not here to defend any one person or their actions or my own. I do believe adversity reveals character. We are all human though and make mistakes. So just do me a favor at least. Lay off the negative comments about people directly if you can. If you can and you must, you know, hate on me. I'll be fine. I can handle it. I don't mind. I'm only trying to convey my experience and perspective. I'll paint the picture and you can decide what you think of it afterwards. But please do show some grace and the way you describe your feelings on those keyboards. Again, let's be helpful, not hurtful.